Bernie Rodham Clinton. Is she the most powerful woman in Washington today? And if so, is that something new? Joining us to sort through the conflict and the consensus are historian Doris Kearns Goodwin, author of the forthcoming book, No Ordinary Time, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, The American Homefront During World War II, Gil Troy, assistant professor of history at McGill University and author of the forthcoming co-presidency, The Emergence of Presidential Couples Since World War II, Suzanne Garment, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and author of Scandal, The Culture of Mistrust in American Politics, and Stephen Hess, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and author of Organizing the Presidency. The topic before this house, the role of the First Lady, this week on Think Tank. The Founding Fathers fiercely debated how the President should be addressed. The Senate offered His Highness, the President of the United States and Protector of Liberties. But the House of Representatives, God bless them, demanded and got the simple and more democratic Mr. President. But should the President's wife have a formal title? None appears in the Constitution. The term First Lady did not become common until the late 1800s. Martha Washington was hailed as Lady Washington. Abigail Adams, an ardent partisan defender of her husband, was derided as Mrs. President. Harriet Lane, niece of President James Buchanan, not Pat Buchanan, served as his first lady and was called America's Democratic Queen. Many first ladies have wielded considerable power. Edith Wilson acted as de facto president after her husband's stroke prompting many to complain about the petticoat presidency and Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt was a legendary and independent political force. Jacqueline Kennedy periodically acted as her husband's surrogate at campaign and ceremonial functions. But in the beginning, she told her staff not to use the title First Lady, saying it sounded too much like the name of a saddle horse. More recently, Nancy Reagan was credited and criticized for exercising behind-the-scenes veto power with a heavy hand. Now, Hillary Rodham Clinton is the first First Lady in a new feminist era with impressive professional achievements and credentials of her own. From the start, she was put in charge of the Clinton administration's most ambitious and controversial program, health care reform. However, her public prominence has attracted both intense admiration and passionate criticism. Panel, uh, let us begin with uh, one fast question going around the room, beginning with uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin. Doris and I were colleagues for a brief period uh, on the Lyndon Johnson White House staff. Of course, you were only six at the time. <laughs> Wish uh, that that were so. <laughs> right. Uh, our opening question, what is the proper role of the First Lady in the 1990s? Well, the most extraordinary thing, I think, is that history suggests that the proper role is what the First Lady defines it to be. It may be different in the 1990s, but up until today, each First Lady has been allowed to become what she wanted. Look at the difference between Eleanor Roosevelt, the most publicized woman of her time. The next woman that comes, Bess Truman, can hide out in the White House. Nobody gets mad. Jackie Kennedy comes along. She's got hats. She's got coats. She's running around in style. The next woman that follows her wears a cloth coat. So, so far, we've been incredibly tolerant, allowing the First Lady to decide what she wants to be. That may be changing right now. Uh, let me go to uh, Steve Hess. Now, Steve Hess was on the White House staff of Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, he was only 13 at the time. <laughs> it, it was a bar mitzvah present, as I recall. But uh, uh, in, in, in any event, how would you put it, uh, Steve? Uh, what is the proper role of well, the First Lady? Well, similarly to, to what Dara said. Uh, but of course, we see we have to start not at the beginning, but at the end. And the present first couple uh, have created an exceptionally interesting high wire act. The idea of uh, truly uh, almost co-presidencies uh, is, is very high risk. If they pull it off, I think other subsequent presidents and, and, and their spouses may do the same thing. But as a rule of political public administration, 
uh, it is a dangerous proposition to give a great deal of responsibility to a person you can't fire. Uh, right. And in but, terms but, of staff, it is a very tricky business to be sitting around the table and one of your co-equal staff is also the spouse of the President of the United States. So if they can pull it off, uh, then that could very importantly change the concept of the first spouse. Uh, Gil Troy, uh, Steve Hess mentioned your magic word, which is co-presidency. Uh, what do you think the role of the modern first lady or the, or the spouse of the president, because there is no official term, First Lady, what do you think well, the role ought to be? Certainly there is no proper role. There's no rights, there's no wrongs. I, I, um, I, excuse I, me, I, I should point down in this, in, in this uh, chronology, Gil Troy was born during the administration of Ronald Reagan. No, <laughs> all right, anyway, no, go ahead, please, right. I have to say that watching the relationship between the presidential couple and uh, the American people is kind of like watching a bad date unfold. Uh, it seems that the presidential couple at one hand doesn't know whether to be substantive or more focusing on style, and the American people don't know what they want. Do they want the uh, First Lady, and if you read the First Lady's correspondence, as I've read of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's, of Mamie Eisenhower's, of Bess Truman's, even at that time people are saying, we want you to help us out. We want you to take on more of a leadership role. And at the same time when First Ladies do take more of a role, everybody says, whoa, you're overstepping your bounds, you're a Lady Macbeth. So it's very con contradictory and no one's quite sure what to do. Susie? I think the proper role of the First Lady is to do whatever it is that strengthens the presidency and thus enables us to be properly led and governed. Uh, what it takes varies enormously over time. And, um, and the situation is made especially difficult by our national fear of nepotism and its consequences. Is, is, uh, is Hillary Clinton different? People, people go around saying, some men can't stand her because she's a powerful woman and they've never dealt with powerful women and she's the first post-feminist. Is, is, she, is she different? Well, you know, I think what's different about her is that she does have the women's movement behind her. Um, what's not different is that Eleanor Roosevelt exercised a lot of the same power that we seem to think Hillary is exercising first. She testified before a congressional committee. She held regular press conferences. She had a syndicated column. She had radio broadcasts. We've sort of forgotten that because Eleanor was so unusual, so far ahead of her you time. You sound as if you've written a book no about this. Oh, no, I can't forget <laughs> right, it. But right. still, I think what's different about Hillary is that she has both the strengths and the weaknesses of representing the modern women. So when people get frightened of her, it's not just her. They're frightened of what all of us are becoming. When they love her, it's because she's representing a new possibility well, let, for women. Let, let, me, let me ask the two Sorry. women on, on the panel uh, who are, each happen to be married to uh, very distinguished husbands. Uh, in, in, in their own right, but... Uh, you first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Susie and, and, and Doris are not on this program because they're, they are wife of, they are distinguished uh, academics. Isn't this a strange situation that the feminist cause is saying, isn't this great that Hillary Clinton has this power when in fact she is the anathema of what they were talking about, which was wife of? I don't think many feminists today would say wife of is uh, necessarily pejorative. A lot of people were born on third base, and this is, this is one of those cases. Uh, so <laughs> I, I'm not sure that it would be considered as much of a contradiction as perhaps it should be. I mean, clearly for the feminist movement, having a woman elected in her own right and being the president would be better than having this power devolved to a first lady. On the other hand, Hillary has made of a position that really has only potential power in it. She's created the power that she has right now, and I think that's what the feminists are applauding, not just that she's the wife and she's sitting there as Mrs. Clinton. So how come feminists didn't applaud Nancy Reagan? I mean, Nancy Reagan was a powerful woman who took advantage of opportunities, and I always try to annoy my students by treating her as a, as a feminist icon. I think the difference is that Hillary Clinton has been at least out front about what she's doing in the administration. She made it clear from the start that she was taking on certain responsibilities, which gives her a little more accountability. The fear for Nancy Reagan, I think, on the part of some people was that all of her power was behind the scenes. The astrologers were floating into Washington. You didn't know where her power was being exercised. Al although Hillary Clinton also changed her tune in the middle of the campaign when people felt that she was coming on too strong. All of a sudden they had this Manhattan Project where they put her under wraps and she put away her scarves and all of a sudden she was, you know, the mom and she was baking chocolate chip cookies. I think that's an important point because if we are going to have a co-presidency, uh, then the American people, in a sense, have to vote on it. It has to be up front when you're running 
uh, for, for office. I mean, I, I feel sort of put upon because uh, at that point I was saying, hey, why all of this attention to the families and so forth? We're voting for the president. Well, that wasn't true as it turned out. So I think the press has a perfect responsibility Steve, Steve, to focus to on others if indeed they're going to assume those ro that role Steve, ultimately. You, you could probably uh, give us a better fix on this than anyone. Uh, Hillary Clinton, as I understand it, is the first first lady to have an office in the West Wing of the White House. If you could give us a little architectural history about what that means, and her own staff, yeah. Yeah. the East Wing, the West Wing, all that stuff. I yeah, think that's uh, important. Yeah, it's a, it's a big proximity to power game that's right. played around the White House. The West Wing is where the president uh, has his office. Uh, and the closer to the president, the better off you are as an assistant. The East Wing, the other side of the residence, is where they usually uh, put the social office and the, uh, and the First Lady. So the movement from the East Wing to the West Wing, in Washington terms, is very, very significant. And, and she has a, a staff there. Yeah. She, she has a, a staff. A, a staff of, of, of substantive people dealing with personnel well, and dealing uh, with... Well, uh, she is I a mean, public official. There's, there's nothing uh, undercover about the situation now. Uh, the question will, is, will this be the situation in the future? Because, of course, uh, the odds are very great, given where presidents come from, the upper middle class, that their spouses will also be what the Bureau of Labor Statistics call from the, occupation, from the uh, managerial professional class. Uh, now, what happens when the spouse is a professional like that? They could take, uh, they could take a Marilyn Quayle or Dennis Thatcher role and just decide that for that period of four or eight years, they will assume the traditional role. Well, but Marilyn Quayle was second lady. Well, uh, but uh, she has aspirations. <laughs> yeah. So and, I mean, and, and there's Bar that. Barbara Bush was first yeah. lady, and she was she, characterized. Well, she wielded a lot of power but not in a terribly public way. I mean, she was very, she was very visible as a figure. Uh, I believe she also wielded a lot of political power in private. But that White House worked very well in that regard. She was not generally known as a Madame Defarge, well, or the <laughs> keeper of the lists. She, she was not known as the Madame Defarge. But she was. But she was. We, we assume no, no, that. that's too <laughs> no. nice a lady. <laughs> 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 Putting this in broader context, what we're really seeing is the expansion of presidential power. I mean, a lot of what's going on in the last 40 years, it's not just what Eleanor Roosevelt did, but it's also what Franklin Roosevelt did and what the progressive movement did in terms of as the government becomes more involved in daily life, people have more demands not only on the president but on his wife. There's, in a sense, a kind of first mommy, first daddy phenomenon going on where people turn to the first lady as first nurturer. Help us out if we have trouble, if we're invalids, if we're widows, if we're um, uh, frustrated with our, with our children. We turn to the first ladies, we write letters to the first ladies saying, you can help us with the government. And I think that's because the government has become more involved in our personal mm -hmm. lives. Look. This, though, this puts the, a first lady in an untenable position, though. If you're going to be first nurturer, you have to have the image of being a very nurturing human being. Mm -hmm. If you're going to carry out any official or quasi-official duties, you have to be pretty tough. And the, the two are in tension, and I think we're seeing them in tension right now. But couldn't you have your professional first spouse uh, assume uh, their professional life. It depends on what they do. Um, uh, Bill Bradley's wife is a professor of German and comparative literature. She could have been that. I think we should allow them to do that, but on the other hand, there's no reason to be angry at Hillary for assuming her professional life as a policymaker. That's what she was, that's what she is. I mean, I don't think it necessarily means that all first ladies are going to become Hillary Clinton. But, but, right, but, 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 but Hillary had a choice, Doris. Excuse me, say, Hillary had a choice. Because she was a lawyer, she probably couldn't have gone go into private practice, but she could have been a professor of law very easily. Which she but it seems like policy she, is, her, is her passion. That's but, what she but, wants but to Doris, do. But Doris, when, when, when then Hillary Clinton, who has been appointed by her husband as the czarina of health care, one-seventh of our economy, without a confirmation process, uh, gets in some political trouble, Whitewater, Cal Futures, whatever it is, uh, people, you know, normally, I mean, Bernie Nussbaum got in some problems, uh, and he was gone. He was out of here. You gone. Uh, doesn't she then have to have the accountability? And how can you have the accountability? You know, you say I divorce you. Walk around her three times no, and say you know, you're out of here. The accountability yeah. will come in that what Hillary or a person like Hillary's power depends on is her reputation. 
if her reputation is hurt by some sort of scandal or by some sort of misdeeds, then her reputation will be hurt and she will not have the same power. So her, her power will be diminished anyway, even if the husband can't divorce her. She'll be banished, you'll see. You won't see her as much. In fact, at tough, tough times, we haven't seen Hillary as much, and then she comes forward when things are better. So there is a, look, the White House staff isn't confirmed, right? They have lots of power. Um, they can be fired, yes, that's a difference. But still, I think reputation is the most important asset a person has in a Washington community. And we do have accountability. If she gets hurt, it'll be destroyed. It's interesting that, that we are so hesitant to accept that kind of informal means of control. And I was mentioning nepotism before, and I think that it's, it's a very deep-seated fear in our politics. Uh, someone who has reached power through blood relationship with the public or marriage relationship with a public official hasn't competed in the same race uh, we may be better at it but we can't get there so it's a kind of slap in the face to an egalitarian notion of how how you proceed in public life so i think no matter how effective that means of control is it may not be accepted as such. I think you're right. There's going to always be people out there wanting to see the person fail because of this meritocracy business in a certain sense. Certainly the farther we get away from the traditional role, the more that person loses the protective coating that both the public and the press put around them. We would see that in a sense with uh, Rosalind Carter a little bit as she went to a cabinet meeting, more so with Nancy Reagan and, and, and now virtually completely. Uh, with, let, let, uh, let me, so that's another way that there let, is a let, check upon it. The let me just try to check. tie this up for a minute. Um, uh, Doris, I, I, I remember hearing stories and I, I think actually seeing memos sent to Lyndon Johnson that came back with his scrawl saying, Ask Bird. In other words, somebody said, should we do this? And gave him those three nice boxes, yes, no, uh, see me. Uh, and it came, Ask Bird. But nobody went around and said, oh, she's running right, the White House. Right. So are we arguing about how merely how public is this going to be in the future or is there some because of the whole feminism thing is there going to be a change you know what what doris said about this is i think very important that uh, that mrs clinton's role is seen by many as uh, the emblem of an entire style that may become dominant in public life and private life so the debate over her role is in part a debate over what style, and I, I use that term advisedly. Uh, someone like Elizabeth Dole would exercise much the same power, but probably in a different style. So the debate is over uh, what style of relations between men and women. You know, I, 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 is, is your theme, the co-presidency, is that salutary? Do you like the idea of a co-presidency? I think. Well, whether it's good or bad, it is. There's, I think one of the things we're missing is the institutional demands on the First Lady. I don't think that Mrs. Bradley would have the luxury of teaching college English anymore. I don't think that a homemaker would have the luxury of just staying at home with the kids. I mean, if you look at the demands on these women to uh, do all the social functions, to do all the diplomatic functions, to have an image. I mean, Nancy Reagan had to have an image, and when the image was too much that she was focusing on buying China, she had to go and change that image and get involved in the fight against drugs. But turn, Barbara turn Bush around a second. Uh, assuming that, that uh, Lynn Martin gets elected, her husband is a federal judge. Mm -hmm. Is he For, going former, to give up? <laughs> former congresswoman from Illinois. Lynn Martin. Yeah, former, former secretary, secretary of, of labor. Of, of labor. Uh, uh, one of those mentioned, not right. up front, but mentioned Dynamite woman. In, the in the Republican right. Party. Her husband is a federal district judge in Chicago. Would he have to give up his judgeship under uh, your expanded role of the... I think I'd, uh, well, first of all, we live in a sexist society, and as a result, that means that there are going to be certain demands on women that there aren't going to be on men. And I think there'd be a lot of talk on, you know, about following the Dennis Thatcher model and having him check out. Mm -hmm. Um, and he might, as a, if, if his, uh, and the, fact, the fact is, if his uh, credentials are impressive enough, he might be able to insulate himself. But there are so many demands on the couple as a couple. There are so many political demands, so many social demands, so many diplomatic demands, that I frankly don't think he would have the luxury. And if I was his boss, I wouldn't want him, because he'd be too busy. That brings up the role of idiosyncrasy <laughs> and individual temperament. There's, there are some people who can do these things rather gracefully, mm -hmm and some people who get other people's hackles up. Um, Mrs. Clinton is, for better or for worse, uh, something of a polarizing figure. 
So in meeting these often conflicting demands, she doesn't, she doesn't get a lot of slack cut for her. Although she did at the beginning. You know, it seems yeah. to me that one of the difficulties that Hillary Clinton is having now is that when she was first lady in those first months, the press went nuts mm -hmm. over the idea that this yeah. was so powerful, she was so extraordinary, yeah. that it was almost like they were waiting to pull yeah. her down. Yeah. Well, the press so always that, gets yeah. it right by averaging. They go yeah. too far one yeah. way, too far the other yeah. way. Yeah. There's also there's a political need for more people to help out the presidency. In other words, when Jimmy Carter first starts running, and he's doing his you know, very intense one-on-one uh, -on -one campaign in Iowa, he needs Rosalind Carter in Florida. And I think the, the presidents need those emissaries to tell the world of television, to the world of press, to the world of entertainment, to kind of make them more famous, you know, to give them a higher profile. You know, he's brought up an interesting point, because one difference today from the past is the media exposure of the private lives of our public figures, so that we become more interested, whatever the First Lady does, she's already been in People magazine, and everybody knows about the kid and the father and the mother, in a way that wasn't true before. I mean, there was one time when President Pierce spoke about the death of his son at his inaugural. It was considered an mm. incredible breach of dignity, because you didn't talk about your private life, even though his little kid had just died before he became president and his wife wasn't even going to speak to anyone because she was so upset. And that's so that's different today. So I mean, today I think it's gone the opposite direction that. today. Yes. You don't and think there's anything we can do about no, it? Are I we going to have you know, no private in, lives anymore? Uh, I, I think it, it will just have to be understood. Is, uh, to the degree that you ask for the power of, from the people, you give up that comparable amount of your privacy. But you are all been around this operation. Every president that I have observed at some point or another says, I need his own privacy. This is just absolutely right. terrible words. I mean, keep Camp David doesn't worry, blah, blah, blah. And then the next day, you get the photo op, op the, the photo op <laughs> opportunity schedule from the White House office, the president. I'm, I'm not talking about the current incumbents, but believe me, I'm sure it's true. Uh, she'll be there, the daughter will be there, the son will be there, her, her, her secret uh, service code name is such and such, her favorite hobby is tennis, blah, blah, blah. I mean, don't those presidents of ours want it both ways? Of course Absolutely. they do. Oh, do they and ever? I'll tell you, that's another interesting piece about this first ladyship, because one of the important functions in the past that I think first ladies performed for their husbands was to allow them to relax. I mean, the famous comment that Jackie Kennedy said, when Jack comes home at the end of the night, he wants to, doesn't want to talk about Cambodia and Laos with me. He wants to talk about the kids and he have candlelight dinners and so forth. And that was one of the difficulties that Eleanor Roosevelt had. Poor Franklin would be in there trying to have his cocktail hour, and she'd come in talking about migrant workers and blacks. And he couldn't relax as a result. So I'm not sure it's very relaxing between Hillary and Bill Clinton at this point in time. And that's a normal function. Lady Bird, as you know, mm -hmm. when Johnson would go off on these crazy jags about the press and, you know, the, the paranoid sometimes, she would stick her hand on his knee and just say, now, Lyndon, don't believe those FBI reports. You know they're not true. And that settling device is very important. But to the extent that a woman becomes a professional, it's hard to be the relaxer. Mamie Eisenhower was in the Oval Office three times in eight years because she didn't want to get involved. No, she wanted, to, she wanted to just right? keep that, you know, that zone of respect. But, you know, I think one of the problems is to the extent that politicians give in to the press's desire for interesting, dramatic stories about their personal lives, as I think Clinton and Gore did in this last campaign, when they gave their convention speeches, they talked so heartfeltly about their private lives. I worry that to some extent they can become like Oprah Winfrey after mm -hmm. a while. There's got to be a mystery to leadership. Part of the great leaders of the past, we didn't know them all that well. I don't know that I want to know what kind of boxers Bill yeah, Clinton I, wears I, when I, he gets I up never, in the morning. I never <laughs> believed that presidents could be, quote, overexposed. People said, oh, don't overexpose them. Do you get the feeling oh, that Cl absolutely Clinton, overexposed. Uh, the president, is absolutely. overexposed for just that reason? I mean, you lose some dignity when every time you turn on C-SPAN, there he is. You say, oh, him again, even if you're interested. That's right. Oh. Let, let's. Uh, Let's wind this thing up. By, uh, let's go around the room and let me ask you uh, each two questions. The way this whole thing has developed, uh, and we can go this way, is it good for women? Is it good for America? To the extent that you mean the way this whole thing has developed, that there's more room for a first lady to have power, exposure, and public stance, I think it is good for women and good for America, yes. <laughs> I think the co-presidency is good for women in that it brings them in. I think it's problematic for America in that it does create this confusion between governance, which is, after all, what the president is supposed to do, and, um, and, and the more fluffy side of things. I think it may be problematic on both counts. Yeah, I do, too. I started by saying it was on a high, uh, this was a high-wire act, and we'll have to see what happens when they get to the other end. And that, uh, Steve Hess, is about where we began this discussion. Uh, thank you, Stephen Hess, Dr. Suzanne Garment, Professor Gil Troy, 
uh, Professor Doris Kearns Goodwin, and thank you. Uh, this is a new show, you know, and we would like to hear from you. So please send your comments to the address on the screen. Until next week, for Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.